Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, if any of you need to uh, visit the facilities, please help yourself. But we're going to just continue on. But it's a brand new facility, so please <laughs> take advantage of the places we have. Amen. <clears throat> and that was awesome, Arthur. I appreciate that. Uh, let me mention that Arthur is going to be the speaker with me in Phoenix this year. We have a... Um, special time there. It's a three-day conference, uh, and we have two morning sessions and a night session over three days. It's at a resort in Phoenix, and it'll be, I forget the exact date. Does anybody know? Anyway, it's right around the 1st of January, and they give us a special where they uh, let us go for a discounted rate. Have they got it up? They got a discounted rate three days before and three days after. So you actually could go for nine days at this uh, resort. We're going to be at the Arizona Grand this year, and it has a great golf course there and stuff. And it's a beautiful place, and it's a great time to go down there. And Arthur will be speaking with me. What? December the 31st through Jan January the 2nd. And uh, it'll be just an awesome time. We've had crowds of up to 2,000 at those, and so that will be a special time. Amen. So thanks again for that. Uh, let me also say I really appreciate the help that Barry gave me. It was awesome. <laughs> that was just awesome. I tell you, that was perfect with what I was uh, talking about. And um, I'm just amazed at how well all of this fits together. It's really, really good. Let me real quickly just go back. Is there anybody here this morning that was not here last night? Could I see your hand? There's a few of you. Well, we have the sessions from last night that you can get. Uh, let me just real quickly go back that I spent a lot of time in Psalms chapter 91 talking about you have to dwell in the secret place of the Most High for all of these things to come to pass. I use John chapter 15 where Jesus said, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, then you ask what you will. And he was talking about abiding, not just frequenting there, going there every once in a while. We also used Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, where it says the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. And the point that I was trying to get at is that you have to live in this consciousness. God is always with us. That's not the question. The question is, are you always aware of his presence? If you were, it would change your thought. It would change your emotions. It would change your actions. It would change everything. And I believe that a tremendous amount of problems that we have come because we are not aware of God's presence with us. Let me use just a couple of more scriptures. There's dozens and dozens of these, but I just thought that these would be good to at least mention quickly. In Joshua chapter 1, and in verse 8, this is what the Lord was uh, speaking to Joshua as he began his ministry. He was taking over from Moses. And he said, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. This fits perfectly with what uh, Arthur was saying. See, some people, when you, anytime you put in there that you have to observe, to do according to all that is written therein, well, then immediately they think of works are earning something instead of grace. But this is just saying that you meditate in the word so that you can cooperate with it, or as he's talking about, have works that are a response to God, not something you do to gain a response from God. Those are totally different. And so you have to meditate in it and observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. You don't prosper and really succeed if you don't meditate in this day and night. Another verse that goes right along with this is Psalms chapter 1. Let me just turn over and read this to you. I know many of you have heard these verses, but I think it's good to turn over and read it. Psalms chapter 1, verse 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now again, see, some people take this and say, all right, so you're saying we got to do all of these things in order to be worthy. No, you're worthy because you've accepted Jesus. God has made everything available to us on an unearned, undeserved basis. You can't 
You can't earn the favor of God. But there are things you can do, as Barry was talking about, that oppose what God has already done for you. You have to learn to cooperate with God. And that's what Arthur was talking about. That's what James was talking about. They're works of faith. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, not works of the law. There's a difference. There's works of the law versus works of faith. And so there are things you have to do, not in order to get God to bless you. God's already blessed you, but in order for what God has done and his presence that's with you, there's things you need to do to capitalize on that, to take advantage of it, to cash the check, as Arthur was talking about. And so it says... Uh, his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night. See, again, this is talking about dwelling in the presence of God, being focused on these things. And it says, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. All of us would like to have whatever we do prosper. We would like to be planted like by the rivers of water so that if there's a drought, it's not going to affect us because our roots go down and tap into things that other people don't have. All of us want these benefits, but very few people will make his delight in the law of the Lord. And very few people meditate in it day and night. They take huge amounts of times off from seeking God. They just seek God in spurts. They have a devotion or whatever. And uh, so again, this is just another confirmation. Here's another one in Deuteronomy chapter six. And all of these things are saying the exact same thing that Arthur was talking about, that Barry was talking about, and that I was talking about last night. But in Deuteronomy chapter six, let me look at the exact verse here. Verse six, this is uh, Moses rehearsing the laws that were given, the Ten Commandments. This is right before he died, and he's just rehearsing these things and reminding them. And he says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. That just pretty much covers all of the time. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and thou shalt be as frontlets between thine eyes. Thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land, which he swore unto thy fathers, Abraham, to give thee. He goes on, he talks about all of these good houses that you just have to remember. In other words, you need to keep your mind constantly stayed upon the Lord, and then you will have perfect peace. So these are all things that uh, I was talking about last night that we've been talking about this morning. There's, it's just rehearsed many, many times over. And we are emphasizing the things that you need to do. But again, it's not things you need to do to get God to bless you. God's already blessed you. These are things you need to do to take advantage, to release what God has already done. You know, I've got a great teaching, I think, on uh, grace and faith that... Grace is what saves us, but God's grace has appeared unto all men, Titus chapter 2, verse 11, but not all men are saved because not all men respond to God in faith. It's not grace alone that changes your life. You have to have a response, not a response of works like I'm earning this. The moment you feel that something you do makes you worthy in the sight of God, it has ceased to be a work of faith. It's now a work of the law, and it will stop the power of God. Sin won't stop the power of God, but works of the law will stop the power of God. God is never going to owe anybody anything and respond because you, you earned it and you made him do it. But he gives everything to us freely, but then we have to take the check and go to the bank and cash it. We have to respond. We have to keep our minds stayed upon the Lord. So I want to state the obvious this morning. I've got about, I think it's five more times after this. And so I'm going to be saying this so many different ways that you can't miss it. You're going to get this. But I'm going to state the obvious. Before you can really dwell in the presence of God, you've got to be totally convinced that God is with you all of the time. I mean, that is simple. But that's obvious. And I think many of us just give mental assent to this. And we say, oh, yeah, I believe that God's with me. But I want to try and drive this point home and just show you from Scripture 
that God is always, always, always with you. Look over here in Matthew chapter 28. These are some of the very last words that Jesus spoke right before he was caught up into heaven. He called his disciples together. And as he was leaving the earth, just as he was being caught back up into heaven, here's what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 28 and in verse 18. And Jesus spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That's a huge statement right there. I hadn't got time to go into that, but that's awesome. It says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. Matter of fact, most translations will say go into all nations and make disciples. When he says you're to teach them, and then in verse 20, he says you teach them to observe all things. This is more than just evangelism. The church basically has changed this mandate to go into all of the world and evangelize. Tell people about the Lord, have them pray a prayer and get saved. But this is a command to disciple people, to make disciples out of them. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, he says, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The only way you can become a disciple is to continue in God's word, not just one time come to the Lord and call out to him and ask for help. You might could get saved that way. You could be a convert, but you cannot be a disciple by just one time responding to the Lord. You have to continue in the word. And then it says, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. It's only the truth you know that makes you free. The truth doesn't make you free. It's the truth you know and that you have continued in that makes you free. So again, see, here's this same dynamic that Arthur's talking about. It's all by the grace of God. You can't save yourself. You can't make anything happen. But there's a reason why some people prosper and others don't. And it's because some people take the grace of God and then they act on it. They respond to it. They keep their mind stayed upon the Lord. They search God with all of their heart and it's not that that earns you the favor of God. It just releases and unlocks what God has already freely given to you. God wants every person in here to prosper. God wants every person in here to be well. He wants every person in here to have joy unspeakable and full of glory. And I can guarantee you that is not true of every person. Not because God isn't the same. Not because God doesn't love you and because God hasn't given you grace. It's because we respond differently. Paul, who was a great grace guy, he said over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, he, well, in verse 9, he says, you know, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace that was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than them all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was in me. Paul who is saying he didn't deserve anything and yet he labored. He worked harder than anybody. He put his mind on the Lord. He sought the Lord, not in order to get God to do something. God had already done it by grace, but in order to renew his mind. Holiness does not change God's heart towards you, but holiness will change your heart towards God. If you seek God and dwell in his presence, it's going to make you more receptive to what God has already done for you by grace. And so he's saying that you need to teach people these things and they need to continue in the word and they need to become disciples, not just converts. So again, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Man, I heard Arthur Sunday talk about this and I do the exact same thing, Arthur. People argue over, are you supposed to baptize in the name of Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost or in the name of Jesus only? Well, Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead, dwells in him bodily. So when I baptize, I say in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost and Jesus. <laughs> so I just cover all the bases, amen. And then he says in verse 20, he says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even unto the end of the world. This is a promise from Jesus. It's one of the very last words that came out of his mouth before he went back into heaven. And he said, I am with you always. There is never a minute, a second 
that God is not with you. I don't care what you feel like. And this goes back to some of the things I was saying last night, that when people come to me and say, oh, God's forsaken me, God's left me, I just don't feel the presence of God. And then they want me to pray with them. In a sense, if I respond to that kind of a request, I'm denying this. I'm saying, well, I I know God said it, but he must not really be there. And so you pray and ask God to do something. No, you need to base your life on facts and not feelings. We pray stupid prayers. Like, oh God, come and be with us today. What a stupid prayer. God says, I'm never going to leave you nor forsake you. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. Matthew chapter 18. And yet you ask God to come and be with you. And people say, oh, well, what we mean is we know that he's always with us, but we want a special manifestation. We want his power manifest. Well, then say that. Amen. Acknowledge his presence and say, you just don't want it to stay in the spirit realm. You want it to come out into the physical realm. Say what you mean. But when you sit there and say, oh God, come and be with us. Or then you pray and say, oh God, go with us as we leave this place, which is a stupid prayer. (laughs) We read that last night in Psalms chapter 91, that his hand is upon us. God never leaves us. You know why we pray prayers like that? Because we don't believe it. We go by what we feel. And I just don't feel any joy. I don't have any hope. I've lost my faith. And so this is what I feel. And so God, please come and touch me. Come and be with me. You are expressing your unbelief. You're speaking doubt. And when you start praying from a position of doubt, you aren't going to arrive at a good conclusion. You need to operate in faith. And you need to just constantly be aware. He gave us his promise, his word. One of his very last words he ever spoke while on the earth was that, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth. You need to believe that. You need to develop this. You need to constantly speak it. You know, I'm not going to take time to turn over there and and show you these scriptures, but in... um, You know, Psalms chapter 91, it talks about that I will say of the Lord, and I said it's voice activated. If you put these two scriptures together, I don't have them right now. I think it's Psalms chapter 31 and Psalms 42. I'd have to turn over there anyway. You can go look it up on your own. But it says that my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. And then it says, write these things upon your heart. You know how you write something upon your heart? You know how it becomes a heartfelt thing? Your tongue is a pen that writes on your heart. Whatever you say out of your mouth gets written on your heart. And not only what you say, but what other people say. If you want to have something really written on your heart, if you want this to become something that is just... uh, dominant in your life and you dwell in the presence of God on a continual basis, then you need to start speaking it. You need to start speaking. Father, thank you that you are with me. And the times that you don't feel the presence of God, Father, I thank you that whatever's going on, I don't care what I feel. This is what truth is. You know, I'm talking as quickly as I can. I've got a lot of stuff to cover here, but I just got to tell you this one example that when I got touched by the Lord in 1968. I had an encounter where I felt the presence of God with me for four and a half months. It was tangible. I could physically feel it. I was so excited about the Lord that I didn't eat a meal for four and a half months. I would just grab something, but I couldn't sit down and eat when God's there. I mean, I, I'm not saying I didn't eat, but I would just grab something as I walked out the door or something. I never slept more than an hour at a time for four and a half months because I was so excited. God was there. I, wa- I didn't want to miss him. And I'd find myself, I, I leaned against the door one time as I was going out the door thinking, I'm just going to rest here for a second. And it was 20 minutes later, I woke up. I fell asleep standing up. But I was so excited about God, I could tangibly feel him, and it was awesome. But after four and a half months, I lost that. There's reasons. That's not my point in talking about that right now. And then right after that, I got drafted, and I went to Vietnam. And in Vietnam, there was just so much ungodliness around me, and there were so many bad things going on. 
And I, had, I couldn't feel his presence. And because of it, I got discouraged and despondent. And I, I spent a lot of time just asking God to kill me because I figured the only way that I could ever get back into the presence of the Lord the way that I had felt it was uh, to go to heaven. I just figured that you couldn't live that way here on this earth. And so I spent a lot of time praying and asking God just to kill me. And then I nearly died twice in one day in <laughs> Vietnam. And I found out I wasn't quite as excited about that as I thought I was. <laughs> and so anyway, I was in this dilemma of God, how do I get back into your presence? How do I feel this again? And I became so despondent over, I just felt like, well, God's forgotten me. He put me on the shelf. God's not going to do anything with me. And and I just nearly, I came close to giving up. And anyway, during this period of time, uh, I woke up one morning, and I don't know how to describe this to you. I don't have the words to describe it, but it was like God was gone. Uh, I really believe that hell is going to be the absence of God. Now, there's uh, the scripture in, uh, I believe it's Luke chapter 15 or 16, talks about the rich man in hell, you know, he was in torment in the flame. And I believe that there's going to be flame. I believe there's going to be physical torment. But the thing that makes hell so bad is that there's just nothing good. God is good. And there won't be anything good. There won't be any kindness. There won't be any mercy. I'm not sure that we will even know other people in hell. It might be total isolation. And it is just going to be void of anything good. And there is no presence of God. Many people think, well, that's the way I live. Not even close. God still makes the sun rise on the just and on the unjust. Today, we've got sunlight. We've got heat. We've got rain that has produced all of this green and all of these things. You've got food. We've got air conditioning in here. There's good things. In hell, there won't be anything good. It's just an absence of God. I don't think any of us even have a clue how much uh, goodness God bestows on us every day. Most of us are just breathing and you aren't even thinking about it. And yet God gives you that breath. Anyway, I woke up one morning and it was just like God was gone. There wasn't anything in the natural that happened, but I lost all awareness of God. And I don't have the words to tell you what this was like. Uh, based on this scripture, I know that God was with me, but I, I didn't have any perception of it. And I mean, fear hit me like I have never felt in my life. That's the closest to being in hell that I ever want to be. And for three days, I was absolutely, totally without any awareness, consciousness of God. It was terrible. I was absolutely petrified. I was a chaplain's assistant, and when people came to the chaplain's bunker, I had to make appointments and stuff like this, and the chaplain was out, and he was gone. I was there by myself, and people would come knock on the, uh, the bunker door, the chaplain's bunker, and I actually went and piled clothes on top of me and laid in a closet hoping that nobody would find me. I couldn't face anybody. I was afraid everybody would see what was going on with me. For three days, it was the worst experience I've ever had in my life. And I prayed and said, oh God, what's going on? And what happened? And I still don't theologically understand what happened. But you know, I, on the third day, I woke up, I slept on a cot, and I was just kneeling beside my cot praying. I don't remember doing it. I just woke up kneeling beside my cot praying. And once again, I was just back to the normal peace. It wasn't the same exuberance and feeling that I had for four and a half months, but it was just back to normal. And I realized God was back. And did you know what? That day I made a decision. Never, ever, ever, ever again will I gripe about not feeling the presence of God. It's like God let me taste what it would really be like to be without God. And I guarantee you, Nobody wants to experience that. And since that time, you know what? Even if I don't feel the presence of God and I don't have a goosebump, 
going up and down my spine. Man, I know that God is with me, and I have lived with that, and I have tried to dwell in this presence of God. And the way you do it is by writing this on your heart, by words. You say it. Don't pray these stupid prayers like, oh, God, where are you? I don't feel you. You're, you're writing the wrong things on your heart. Write and say, Father, I don't care what I feel. Thank you that you're with me. Man, I pray I do not experience what Andrew experienced in Vietnam. Oh, God, <laughs> don't let that happen. I believe, I believe that you're with me. And if you don't feel anything, just start praising him by faith based on what God's word says. You know, if you would do that, you would find out that the more you think on it and focus on it, and the more you praise him and give him thanks, that's what the Bible calls faith. You don't feel it. There's no physical proof of it, but you just are going to do it because this is what God's word says. You'll find out that faith is what primes that pump and makes the joy and the peace of God begin to come. And you'll wind up operating in more joy and peace when you operate in faith and when you do going by your feelings. Look over in John chapter uh, 14. Here's Jesus speaking to his disciples the night before his crucifixion. And he says in John chapter 14, in verse 14, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Again, I'm using these scriptures just to underscore that God never leaves you nor forsakes you. I don't care what your feelings are. I don't care what your experiences are. Romans 3, 4, let God be true and every man a liar. God never leaves you. God has never left you. He will never leave you. He will give you a comforter that will abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Boy, here is really the, kind of the key. People say, but I, I can't see him. I don't feel him. They are only trying to contact God in the physical, natural realm. You are a spirit being. God is a spirit. John 4, 24. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You have to deal with God through the spirit and not through your senses. God could manifest himself. He's done it in scripture. There's many times there was glory clouds. There's physical manifestations and all of these things. But the Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please him. God is a God of faith. He created us to be faith beings. Did you know that the way that the human race lives today is so fallen from what God created us to be? Many people, the things that we're talking about, about living, dwelling in the presence of God and all of this, it just seems abnormal. Did you know it's our experience and it's your perspective and your reference point that's abnormal? God created us to live and move and have our being in him and to dwell in him and keeping your mind stayed on God 24 hours a day to where even your dreams are about God and stuff. That's normal. The way most of us live is abnormal. It's like there's an alternate reality that sadly even most Christians don't even believe or know that exists. They just think that, you know, giving God token and, and you, you, you know, have a little devotion and you go to church on Sunday and you be a relatively moral person, but the rest of the time it's just yours and you do what you want to. Most people, that's their reference point. That's what's reality to them. True reality, God created us to be in communion with him constantly. And now we can walk by faith and not by sight, but the world can't receive this because they can't see God. And because they can't see him, they just don't believe anything exists beyond what they can see, taste, hear, smell, or feel. I got some great teaching on that. He says in verse uh, 18, he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while and the world seeth me no more, but ye sh shall see me because I live, ye shall live also. At that day, ye shall know that I am in my father and ye in me and I in you. God is in you. He can't get out of you. He lives in you. 
And yet we pray these stupid prayers. Oh God, just stretch forth your hand and go and touch this person. God already lives in them. And yet you're asking God to go touch this person. Somebody said, well, you know what I mean. Well, then you ought to say what you mean. You know what you're really doing is out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. And because you don't see anything, because the person's laying in the hospital bed and he's not recovering and, this, and the uh, prognosis is bad, well, then that's what you believe is reality instead of the fact that God's with him. You can't see it. So you pray and that he'll go and touch him. And he says, uh, at that day, you shall know that I am in my father and ye in me and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved to my father. I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. And in the context here, he literally lives on the inside of us. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. He's with us constantly, constantly. There's never a second, a moment that he's not with you. Look at this over in Hebrews chapter 13. Again, I know that y'all have heard these things, but it's like Barry was talking about. He understood it long before he understood it. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 13, let me just break into verse 5. He says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is why he says that don't be covetous. Covetous is desiring something that you don't have, desiring something that somebody else has. You know what will kill covetousness? Is just constantly dwelling in the presence of God and remembering that he's with you every second. If you really, boy, as Barry was talking about, if you could open up the ark, if you could see what's on the inside of you, if you could meditate on that and get a revelation of what God has given you, why would you want anything else? What else is there to satisfy? Any person who is covetous and dissatisfied and feel like you've got to have more, you are walking in a deficit of understanding that God is with you and focused on that. You know, I was at a church not too long ago, Johnson City, Tennessee, and a person just came up and there was a man and he was just nearly hyperventilating. Like, I can't believe I'm talking to you. I see you on television every day. And he was just, wow, wow. He was just, oh, I can't believe this. This is such an honor. And I usually don't say a lot, but this guy needed something to be said. <laughs> And I just looked at him and I said, you know, if you'd spend more time in the presence of God, you wouldn't be near as impressed with me. <laughs> and you know what? When you just, when you put people on these pedestals and oh man, like look at this person, it shows that you aren't used to fellowshipping with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If you were really used to that, you could walk in to the president of the United States or any person, it doesn't matter who it is. And if you are living with God Almighty 24 hours a day and having God Almighty love you and fellowship with you, it kind of reduces everybody else down to a level that they aren't on a pedestal anymore. Now, this doesn't mean that you don't honor people that need to be honored and things like that. But I'm saying compared to God, nobody else is worth anything. And when you just over, overcome with being around somebody and you can't believe this, it shows that you haven't been spending time with God. You haven't been in his presence. When you get into the presence of God, it just kind of reduces everybody else to not much. <laughs> so you, could, you would end covetousness if you really were thinking about God. You're with me. You know, in Vietnam, I lived in a bunker that I built. And it was not very fancy. And most nights I pulled bunker guard every single night because there was nothing to do. And so I volunteered for bunker guard. I'm probably the only guy in Vietnam that bought, volunteered. And every night for 13 months, I pulled bunker guard. So I had a bunker, but at night I'd go out and sleep outside. And there was a rock that was kind of rounded on the top and it was awesome. I could lay on this rock and it was rounded so that when it rained, all of the water would flow away from me instead of... And I slept on this rock 
10, 12 hours at a time. People have to come wake me up. Man, I couldn't lay down that for five minutes now. But back then I could sleep like a rock. And you know what? I slept outside. I had nothing. I had nothing. We went, we were under attack and we were isolated. And for 40 something days, all we had was pea soup, split pea soup out of a can. And because we couldn't be resupplied, they kept diluting it till eventually it was just kind of green waters all it was. <laughs> to this day, I can't eat pea soup. <laughs> and we had nothing. And you know what? I was just seeking the Lord and loving God and I didn't need anything. To this day, you know, I praise God for the house we've got. It's wonderful. I love it. But I could live, I could live outside. It's not a problem. If you are in the presence of the Lord, you shouldn't have covetousness. It would make you content with what you have because after all, God is with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. I can't relate to people who say that they're lonely. I just don't understand that. And I know some of you again are sitting here critical of me, but I'm saying that you have God with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. And if you could just dwell in his presence and enjoy his presence, get to where you commune with God, how can you be lonely having God with you? Some of the greatest times I have in my life are when I am completely by myself. Nobody else is around. It's awesome because I'm never by myself. I'm with the Lord and man, I'm just free to talk to him and sing and worship. I can dance and nobody pays any attention to anything. Amen. <laughs> Nobody's watching nothing and it's just awesome. Man, God will never leave us nor forsake us. Look over here in Psalms 139. I'm just trying to drive home this point before you can start enjoying the presence of the Lord. You got to be absolutely convinced that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. In Psalms 139, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and my uprising. That's old English for you know when I'm sitting down, you know when I'm standing up. Thou understandest my thought afar off from a long distance is what this is talking about. Thou compassest my path with and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but O oh Lord, thou knowest it altogether. That's pretty strong. God knows when you're sitting down, when you're rising up, God knows every thought that you've ever, th ever thought. It's amazing. God Almighty, who has a universe to run, knows every thought of every one of us. You know, I opened up my garage door two days ago, I think it was, and there was a sparrow laying there dead. I guess it had run into the garage door or something, and it was laying there. And I looked at that, and I thought, God, you knew that sparrow. You knew everything about it. It says that there's not a sparrow that will fall, but God knows it. And I was looking at that and thinking about how many birds we've got and stuff. And yet God knows everything that there is to know about that bird. He knows every thought, every feeling, every emotion, every desire. He knows everything about you that there is to know. In verse 5, thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Man, God's behind us. He's before us. He's got his hand on us in the new covenant. He's in us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. You can't get any closer to God than we are. And yet, most people, well, I know all of that, but I'm not satisfied. It reminds me of Thomas. You know, in uh, John chapter 14, he was talking to his disciples the night before his crucifixion. And he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And then he says, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. And Thomas said, Lord, show us the Father and it'll satisfy us. He just said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he says, oh, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. You could turn it around this way and say, I'm not satisfied with you, Jesus. But if I could see the Father, then I'd be satisfied. 
They had Jesus, God, manifest in a physical body, which, which we've never had. We would love to have that. They had it for three and a half years. They walked and talked with him. They had something that most of us would have been thrilled with, and yet they weren't satisfied. That's not enough. Man, if, I, if the heavens could open and if I could see God Almighty sitting on the throne, then I'd be satisfied. Let me just say that if you aren't satisfied with Jesus, you're just hard to satisfy. <laughs> they weren't satisfied with what they have. We aren't satisfied. Oh, God, I know that you're with me and I know you'll never leave me, but I'm not satisfied with that. You should be satisfied with it. Instead of God coming down to our level and just becoming carnal and physical to where he's going to, you know, he could make a dog walk by every day and say, I love you, Renan. You're awesome, David. Great, actually. He could have a dog talk to you. You made a donkey talk to Balaam. He could have a bird come sit on your shoulder and whisper in your ear everything that you need to do. God could make a bolt of lightning come. God could manifest right now and walk through this auditorium. And most of us say, yes, <laughs> do it. But did you know that that's not the nature of God? God is supernaturally natural. God is subtle. Faith is what pleases him. If, if there were physical things and if God walked up to you in his physical person and said, all right, I told you to come to Karis Bible College, are you coming or not? He might could get you to obey, but you know what? It wouldn't have been faith that brought you here. Faith is superior. Seeing him by faith is superior to seeing him by feelings, by sight. Did you know when Jesus showed up on this earth, he didn't come in a 747 or he could have done all kinds of things. It would have really grabbed people's attention. Instead, he came in a way that I'm sure Joseph and Mary, Mary had never had sexual relations with a man and she knew that this was totally God and yet it took faith to look at this baby who is absolutely dependent upon them, couldn't control his bowels, had to be cleaned up, had to be fed, had to be nursed, had to, everything had to be done for him to look at him and say, this is my creator, this is God. Wow, it's amazing. That's the way that God chose to come. God chooses to operate in subtle ways. He could force you, he could make you bow the knee, but you know what? That wouldn't be faith. All of the people in Jerusalem saw Jesus crucified and saw him buried. Did you know he could have just started a worldwide revival right then by when he rose from the dead, just hover over Jerusalem and let every single person see him. And yet there's not one instance in scripture that Jesus appeared to a single person who wasn't already a believer. He didn't make one person become a believer. He only appeared to those who already believed. That's not the way most of us would have done it. If it had been me, I'd have appeared to Pilate. I'd have shook his bed. <laughs> I'd have woke him up and said, hey, Pilate, are your hands clean now? Man, he'd have hit his knee. I'd have gone to those soldiers who blindfolded him and spit in his face and hit him and said, if you are the Christ, prophesy who it is that hit you. And I'd have said, let me tell you a few things. I would have spoken to him. I could have made them all believe. But that's not the nature of God. And some of you may struggle to understand this, but once you begin to understand and relate to God by faith, faith is better than sight. Faith isn't a way to sight. Faith is better than sight. It's a superior way. You can take the man in the eighth chapter of the book of Matthew, the centurion, who asked Jesus to come heal his servant, and, he, and Jesus was on his way, and he stopped him and sent a messenger and says, I don't need you to come into my house. Just speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Because I'm a man under authority. I have soldiers under me. I tell one go, and he goes. Another come, and he comes. Another do this, and he does it. You speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. And Jesus marveled. There's only twice in scripture that Jesus marveled. Once at this man's great faith and once at his disciples' unbelief. He was amazed that people could operate in this kind of faith. He was amazed that his disciples could be so dull after three and a half years of sitting under his ministry. 
And he says, I'm marveling. He says, I have not found such great faith. No, not in Israel. This man wasn't even a Jew. He was a Gentile. And he had more faith than any Jew Jesus had ever met. Now contrast that with John chapter 20, where Thomas, you know, he got the name Doubting Thomas. There's a reason for that. And Thomas, he wasn't with the disciples when Jesus was first resurrected from the dead and appeared to the disciples. But they told him, says, we saw the risen Lord. He's alive from the dead. We saw the print in his uh, hands and the nail prints in his feet. And Thomas said in John chapter 20, unless I see with my eyes and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Not believing is a choice. Some people think I can't help it. I just don't believe. No, you chose to be that way. You chose to be taught this way. You chose to believe that the only thing that's real is what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. You chose that. He says, I will not believe. And then Jesus appeared in John chapter 20, somewhere around verse 23, somewhere around in there. And he says, he walked right up to Thomas and said, Thomas, Put your finger into the print of the nails and put your hand into my side and don't be faithless, but believing. He wasn't there when Thomas said those things and yet he knew exactly what Thomas said. Just like we're reading right here that there's not a word in his tongue that God doesn't know. God knew everything he had thought, everything he said, even though he wasn't physically in his physical resurrected body present. And when he said this to Thomas, Thomas fell down and he says, my Lord and my God. There's no indication that he ever stuck his finger into the print of the nails or his hand into his side. When he saw him, he knew that it was Jesus. And he, con- he fell down and confessed, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said unto him, he says, Thomas, because you saw me, you believe. Yea, rather, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus put the greater blessing on people who believe because of the word than those who believe because of sight. And this is the reason that God doesn't have a dog walk by and tell you everything and a bird sit on your shoulder. He's not, he's not trying to come down. He already came down to our level. He did become a man. He gave us more than ample enough proof. Now he's trying to draw us up to his level. And get us to walk in faith, which is infinitely superior to sight. He's trying to get us to go by what he promised in his word. And not just because you have a goosebump up and down your spine. Now that you know that God is there. Because there was a glory cloud in the room. He's trying to get us to where we just walk in what the word says and walk by faith. You have to practice God's presence. Man, is it 12 o'clock? Somebody turn the clock back. Amen. I'm going to just let me hurry through some of these things. It says in verse six, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. I don't believe any of us fully understand God with us. Nobody has a full revelation of this. But you know what? That's not going to keep me from pursuing it. It's like Paul says, I haven't obtained, but I'm pressing towards this mark. I can't say that I fully understand this, but I tell you what, it's, it's, it's too wonderful. How in the world can God be with seven point something billion people all at the same time and know every thought, every breath, every word, everything about us? I don't know, but I believe he comes by it honest. In verse 7, he says, Whether shall I go from thy spirit or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up to heaven... Thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. That's amazing. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about thee. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the night are both alike to thee. You can't go anywhere away from his presence and you can't go into darkness and hide. He can see as well in the dark as he does in the day. For you have possessed my reins, talking about my heart. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest part of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance 
Yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written when in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Do you all have the NIV translation of that, uh, what is that, 16th verse? Do you have that? It says, you even saw my unformed um, body and all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Man, that is awesome. You know what this is talking about? A baby at conception. God already knows everything about them and has already written down everything about their life. Now, this needs to be explained in the sense that God, this doesn't mean that God sovereignly makes you do whatever you do. He had a plan for you. Every one of us from the moment of conception, God already wrote in his book what our life was supposed to be. But you have complete freedom to choose whether to obey that and become what God wants you to be or you can rebel and do whatever you want to. That's well established in scripture. But God had a plan for you. And what this says is that from the moment of conception, a, that baby is a person. When you kill a child in the mother's womb, you have killed a person who God knew completely and already knew every word that they would ever think, every thought that they would ever have, every emotion that they would ever have, everything about them, and you just killed that person. It is not a fetus it is not a hump of flesh. It's a person from the moment of conception. John the Baptist at six months into the pregnancy while he's still in his mother's womb, when he heard Mary's salutation, the babe leaped in her womb for joy and was filled with the Holy Spirit. God did not fill a hunk of flesh with the Holy Spirit. He filled a person. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what this is talking about. How precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. That is amazing. Think about this. Think how many grains of sand there are on the earth. Nobody can number that. It's impossible. And yet God's thoughts towards me and towards you are greater than the grains of sand on this earth. God thinks about you all of the time. God is thinking of you constantly. Praise God. Again, he's got a universe to run and yet he just thinks about you. His focus is on you. It's on people. He says, if I was to count them, they are more than number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. You can't go to sleep and forget him. He's still with you. He never leaves. Surely thou will slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody man. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. You know, this whole psalm is talking about God's presence being with you. And then it talks to the ungodly, and it says, get away from me. You know what it's saying is that you can't really dwell in the presence of God and dwell in this and, and still associate with, and do things that are ungodly. It's not that God ever leaves you. You could go to hell and he'll still be with you in hell. You go to the farthest reaches of the earth, he's still there. God never leaves you, but your awareness of his presence leaves. First Corinthians 15, 33 says, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. If you think, well, I can do all these things, I can watch anything, I can listen to people talk about ungodly things, I can watch ungodly movies, I can read ungodly things, and it just doesn't affect me, you're deceived. Evil communication corrupts good manners. And so this is what he's talking about in verse 21, I do hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart and try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So again, these scriptures are just saying that you know what? God is always, always, always with you. He never changes. His thoughts are on you constantly. He knows every thought that you have, every feeling that you have, everything that's going on. God never leaves you one second ever. He never will. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. 
If you acknowledge that, that should change your emotions. You should lose covetousness. Man, if God Almighty is with you, what else do you need to be happy? If God is with you, then why do you get so upset when somebody else rejects you? It's because God's presence isn't real. It's because you haven't written it on your heart. You aren't focused on God being with you. This is the way I cope with criticism. You know, we just had this last week, some things happening, people here in the city, leaders in the city coming out and criticizing us. I don't like to be criticized. Nobody likes to be criticized. And they're saying untrue things about us. And our first response was to sit down and, all right, we'll answer this. And we'll, and you know what, I finally decided I'm just going to turn the other cheek and let them say what they want to say about me. We're holding a banquet for some people, leaders in the city. And we, just, we talked about excluding this person from the banquet. <laughs> and you know what, I thought, man, Jesus said, don't, you know, give in kind, don't curse, just bless and curse not. And so we're going to bring this person that's speaking so bad of us and honor them and bless them. Amen. We're going to win them over. We're going to get these people bored again. Amen. Amen. But see, this is how I cope with people that criticize me. If I just sat there and thought about just me, just in myself, nobody likes criticism. Something's wrong with you if you like criticism. God didn't make you to like criticism. He created us for fellowship. But the way I deal with it is just say, Father, thank you that you love me. And when I start focusing on how much he loves me and I dwell in his presence, you know what? Compared to him, you're nobody. <laughs> and you just lose your importance and your criticism of me, it just shrinks it down to where it's no big deal. Amen. I had a guy come criticize me one time, just blast me and say all kinds of things. And I stopped him right in the middle and I said, who died and made you God? And he just, well, what are you saying? I said, you aren't God. I said, God loves me. If God loves me, who cares about what you think? He says, well, you should care. And I said, I don't. I said, you are nobody compared to God. And that may, maybe you should be nicer than I am, but I'm just telling you, that's exactly what I said to him. And that's the way I dealt with it. And you know what? That's the way I deal with stuff. There's there's thousands of blogs written about me, about I'm the worst man, the most, uh, what? the most dangerous man in the United States and terrible things said about me. And you know what? The way I deal with it is, first of all, I don't listen to them. I don't read them. But if something does come across my path, I just turn to the Lord. Father, thank you that you love me. And even though I'm not perfect and I wished I could represent you better, you love me. And I just take refuge in his love. It's his secret place, his presence. And I go there and it keeps me and it keeps me on an even keel. It keeps me from being bothered by what other people have to say. Anyway, I'm not through, but I'm going to quit. We'll continue this tonight. I got some really awesome things to share with you. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord.